Okay, great. Tonight, we are talking about the cycles of culture shock. You guys remember last week? All those fun stories about what your culture shock can look like? And really, we only covered what culture shock looks like when you're driving in Asia and Africa. They're like a million examples. I just figured those were the best for visuals and to make you really feel what it's like. So, let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll get into tonight's lesson. Lord, we come into your presence and we thank you so much for allowing us one more day to be together as a class or to be together as a family or that you provided food for us and a time of fellowship in these next few hours as we wait upon you to hear your heart, Lord. May our heart be with what causes your heart to be. Lord, give us your eyes as we look into the world. Lord, give us your eyes as we look into the mirror and feel inadequate. But Lord, we know that you've called us, that you are going to empower us, and that you are sending us. Give us wisdom tonight with these practical matters of culture, culture shock, and how our emotions will cycle up and down through these things as we walk with you, trust in you. Lead us, Jesus, into your everlasting work on this earth to change souls for eternity. We thank you, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So tonight, the cycles of culture shock. And I didn't know that Shane was going to do announcements about the mission trip, so I'm going to add on to that a little bit. You should have gotten uh, on your desk a list of uh, different trips that are out there. Just notice this. We have, from this point until the end of the year, we have three more homeless outreaches, five more outreaches to Mexico. Now, these are all one week, and the homeless things are one day to Los Angeles, to Skid Row, to our uh, largest homeless population here in Southern California, and then to Mexico. Those are for the weekend. Very easy to do. You will need your passport, as Shane said. And then we have two outreaches to Muslims here in America. One of them is going to be in Southern California, and the other one's going to be in Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan is the largest uh, conglomeration or condensed Muslim population in America is in Dearborn, which right next to Detroit. So we're going to do an outreach there, and that's going to be a really neat time, and be a part of that. That will change your life. And then as you can see, Haiti is uh, on that list, going to Haiti. That doesn't take two or three weeks. It only takes one week. It's a lot less money, but it's definitely a devastated area that needs a lot of help. And then we also have, uh, finally, the trip to Africa at the end of the year, and that will be the day after Christmas, all the way through the new year, ministering in northern Uganda, and that is mostly in Muslim populations. And we can send out uh, this if you want this. I can send you guys this PDF, and I can add James Flores' number. He's the one that's leading these mission trips. I can send those to you as an email. Um, if I forget, uh, maybe send me a message tomorrow and remind me that I said that tonight. And then for sure, I'll get it out to you. And you can you know, uh, be a part of that or not. That's totally optional. But as uh, Shane mentioned, we call it putting feet to your faith. We talk about faith. We say we believe in what we're doing and what we're being trained to do. Well, these are those first steps to really put feet to our faith. All right, let's look at uh, the review of the reading from this week. In Ministering Cross-Culturally, we read from pages 91 to 99, and we talked about self-worth. Now, this is something that you aren't normally confronted with when you're living in your own home culture because you've already developed in your cultural context a sense of self-worth. You have family and friends, community, jobs, uh, schooling, these things around you that make you feel like you're a productive member of society. And as Westerners, when we feel like we're productive members of a society, we have self-worth. It's just it's this unwritten thing that's going on in our hearts. But when you move to a new country, all of those concepts of feeling like I'm productive are stripped away, totally, completely stripped away. So in our reading, we looked at the two different ways that the world in general, on the far left or the far right, sees self-worth. Some of the world uh, feels that they're born into a family or a community, and because you're part of that community, that tribe, that uh, you know, group of businesses, then you have self-worth given to you. That's called a scribe. So it's given to you because of where you were born and what family you live in. You know, in the Bible, it talks about so-and-so is the son of 
is the son of is the son of the reason why they do that because in the Hebrew culture when you were born as a son of Abraham right you're already in a sense a chosen person and if you're the son of Joseph, well, then you're even a more special chosen person or whatever. So that's why those cultures do that. Many cultures do that. In our culture here in the West, we don't do that. Where do we fall in this sense of feeling self-worth? We earn it. It's not ascribed to us. We actually work for it. And we work hard for it. Sometimes we use the term climb the ladder. You've heard the term climb the corporate ladder. It means to feel successful. You have to start off in a some you know medium position, and because of your hard work, your tenacity, you never give up, and you just keep climbing and you keep climbing. And so, in some parts of the world, you work for this sense of being <laughs> worthy. In other parts of the world, you're born with a sense of being worthy. We must see that so that when we go to somebody else's culture, they don't care what they're doing in that moment as long as they're the son of, or the daughter of, or the cousin of. They feel it, and we're trying to work, and they say, what are you working for? You either have it or you don't have it. So these, these are concepts that we need to think about as we're going out. We're not going to talk about that tonight, but I think the book did a great job of it. And then you remember what the author said? How did Jesus see these two concepts of self-worth? He threw them both out, didn't he? He said it's not about working hard or about being born into a certain family. You remember when the Jews said, we have Abraham as our father? That's what they were saying. We found him worthy worthiness before God because Abraham was our father and Jesus says you're not even children of Abraham you might be of the flesh but you're not of the spirit you're sons of the devil and that was pretty intense so Jesus said forget about all of those worldly concepts of feeling worthy if you want to be great in God's kingdom you must become what the president of the country you must become you know or you must have been born into a certain family no you must be a servant of all so Jesus rejects these two completely and says there's a whole nother way. Now that's something that we all need to grapple with at this moment. Lord, if you call me into another culture and I feel like I am worth nothing because I can't speak, I don't understand, I don't know what to do, I'm not able to share, all of those things I did so naturally in my own culture, now they're stripped away from me. And the Lord says just be a servant. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, become a servant of all. Normally, we always say the Bible is a balance of the two worldviews. In this one aspect, the Bible says throw out those worldviews and become a servant. Now, here's an interesting thing. When you serve people anywhere in the world, you are showing God's love in a way that is uncommon to the people. A friend of mine in Sri Lanka, his name is Kana. I'm not even saying it right, but that's what I would say it in my English. Kana. Kana was born in a low Hindu caste family. His father died when he was a young boy. So he and his brothers, at young ages, like 8, 10, 12, and 14 years old, the only jobs they could find to support their family, because their father is now dead, and their mother is now a widow, the only jobs they could find was going to the cattle farms and scooping up cow dung in their hands with like a blanket or a piece of cardboard, and then carrying that cow dung a few miles down the road, you can imagine, they're covered in this, down to a farmer that's growing food. So I guess one would be a rancher and one would be a farmer. So they would, they would deliver the cow dung from one place to another. So they were born into a low system, and now that they have no father, they're doing the most uh, despised job in the country. And Conan, as I asked him, I said, you're a Christian pastor, but you were born into this Hindu family. How did you hear the gospel? And he said there was a former Buddhist man, which has the same mentality with this caste system, that was born again, and he would sit on his porch, and he would watch me walk by every single day. But in this part of the world, Rob, that man would never interact with me because he was wealthy, he was a homeowner, he was dressed nice, he was highly educated. He would never interact with a kid carrying dung down the road. But one day, the man said to me as I passed by his house, you look tired. Why don't you put down your cow dung, come up on my porch, and sit with me, and I'll make you a cup of tea. And Conan said, the moment I touched this man's teacup, which was like some real fancy British teacup, the moment I touched it, I went into shock. Like, why would he even allow me to sit on his porch? Why would he serve me tea? And day after day, this man showed me love. A man that was wealthy humbled himself and became a servant to the lowest servant in the community. And he said, after a series of conversations, I realized it was Jesus in this man. 
So I walked away from Hinduism. He had already walked away from Buddhism. And we started following the Lord. And I thought, wow, how beautiful it is. I hear that all over the world. When we become servants, it doesn't matter where we're born or what we do, we display Jesus. Serving the lowest people on the planet. Isn't that what the Lord did? That's where greatness comes in our world. And so cross-cultural immersion, meaning you're dumped into it, you're totally submersed into it, will bring about total loss, total stripping of your identity. And you'll feel like you're worth nothing. That's right where the Lord wants you, isn't it? We call this the great breaking. The Lord wants you broken. He wants you like that piece of spaghetti that we talked about two weeks ago, cooked in hot water, in cultural conflict, so that you become flexible, so that He can use you. So when you feel a sense of a loss of self-worth, know that that's right where the Lord wants you. This is where your new identity is going to come from. And then our other reading was from Cross-Cultural Connection, and we read from pages 98 to 114, talking about trust and relationship. Trust and relationship. Now, wasn't it brilliant the way that the author said, take a circle and make a large outer circle, and then a medium uh, center circle, and then a small inner circle. And in the very middle, put the people you trust the most. And then, one step out, the people you trust a little. And then one step further, the people you don't trust at all. Wow, was that challenging? Man, talk about challenging. What was he doing? He was saying to us, before we even go cross-cultural, find out how you can build trust with people in your own community. People that have offended you, people that have done things to you where you feel like they don't love you, and you don't want to reciprocate the love that Jesus wants you to because they've done something, you don't trust them, and you said, in a sense, that person is always going to be at my arm's distance. Now, I've got a whole series of people like that in my life. I'm just like you. I haven't mastered this. And I was looking at that, and I was thinking, wow, Lord, you're really digging deep on this one. You are digging deep. What does he want us to do in this, in this teaching, in this reading? He wants us to begin to build trust with people in our own culture so that we can learn to humble ourselves. We can learn to take the lower place to love and to connect, to communicate. Because if we can't do it here, always remember this, you'll never do it there. If you can't do it in your own culture, you won't do it in a foreign culture, because what happens in the foreign culture? Everything they say, do, and act like will offend you. Everything that happens in this foreign culture will offend you. So now you start to become a missionary where it hurts the most, so that then you trust in the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to build relationships with my family, with these people, with these situations that have happened in my own life. And then he talked about, after we went through the circle of trust and that heart-wrenching exercise, he talked about relationships versus schedules. Western-minded, right? All schedules, Eastern-minded, all relationships. And everyone falls on one side or the other. Rarely does somebody fall right in the middle. To me, that's where the Lord wants us, that balance of the middle. Where do I fall? Schedules. It's all about get the job done, get in, fix it, build it, make it, and get out. Relationships, yeah, if they happen, that's okay, but you know, they're not necessary for me personally. This is my flesh that I'm speaking from, not the spirit. Well, my flesh, that's what my flesh says. The Spirit says it's all about relationships. And if you get the job done, great. But that's not the priority. So we're looking at these things with building trust and doing relationships. And then I think the best way that, that he said, I just picked out this one sentence. He said, do what they do. Build trust by doing what they do. Remember the example of the grown man holding my hand? What was he saying to me? You're entering into my life. You're entering into my circle of trust. You're actually becoming one of my inner circle. And so I'm going to show it to you by interlocking my fingers with yours. What did everything in my American flesh do? Oh, cringe. Don't touch me like that. Get your hand off of me. I don't want to hold your hand. But what was my friend saying to me? You're now part of my circle of trust. And so what did I have to do as a cross-cultural worker? Do what they do. It was an homosexual act. It wasn't weird to him. What he was saying is, I trust you. I'm entering into your world. You're entering into my world. And then as we're developing this thought, the one note that I put down was the greatest way 
to build trust with somebody is to suffer with them. The greatest way to build trust with anybody, anywhere in the world, your culture and a foreign culture, is to suffer with them. So God would design these situations for you to suffer, maybe through a sickness, and then they minister to you, and you build trust. Like you realize, I wouldn't have lived through the week or the month without my local people, even though I don't believe in their medicine and I don't understand what they're doing. Without them, I would be gone. And when they see your willingness to stay in their country, to stay in their community, knowing it's creating suffering, it could be sickness, this would be physical sickness, like the wrong kinds of food or bad water. It could be a mental thing, like culture shock. We're going to talk about tonight how we go into these deep depressions, and they watch you go through that, but you don't run away. You stay with them. Or it could be a, a personal security. People come, and they attack you. You know, they, they rip you off. They, they, they rob from you. Maybe they shoot at somebody. Maybe you're part of a situation where people die, and people are bleeding. And it is heart-wrenching, but you don't go anywhere. You might take a couple weeks off to try to understand what's going on, but then you come back. You say, no matter what happens, I'm with you through the thick and through the thin. What does it say when we get married? Through sickness and health, right? For better or for worse. That's not just between you and your spouse. That's between you and the people that you're ministering with. I am with you to the very end. When they see you suffer with them and they know your suffering is because you're there in their community, their hearts will just open wide up. Even if they don't speak your language or you don't speak their language, suffering will open up doors that nothing else can. Now think about the way that the Lord has proven that he loves you. When he hung on that cross, he proved for eternity, I love you. You know when you're taking communion? I like to simplify things. I don't want to like when I take communion or I pass out communion to church, I don't go off on these long tangents of what communion is. I just say, you see this piece of bread? What's this mean? He loves me. That's it. When this piece of bread goes in my mouth, cracker, whatever it is, or the pita bread, when it goes, it's a, he loves me. Because when I see his hands on that cross, no matter what I feel like, no matter what the enemy's saying, no matter what kind of trials in my life, it means he loves me forever. That's the beginning of what? Relationship. That's what we do with them. The same thing the Lord did for us, we do it with them. Now, we don't save them. We know that. But we preach the same gospel that Jesus did. I'm willing to lay it down. Now think of it. When are the times in your life when you're closest to the Lord personally? Not just that moment of being born again and asking for forgiveness and feeling your sins being washed away. But it's when you're suffering and Jesus is holding your hand every step of the way. A family member is passing away. Something in your life is broken. All your money's gone. Something's out of your control. And who's with you? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's when my relationship with him grows the most, in suffering. It is the same way with you and the people God has called you to. So God has given us these wonderful times, learning to trust him when we are broken and the people see our willingness to stay with them, so they then will trust us. So we had a great reading. I wanted to talk more about it, but we still have to cover our text for tonight and our subject for tonight. So let's just review quickly. What we talked about last week, so we can get ourselves caught up to speed. We looked at the picture of this little western girl with her beautiful blue eyes and her blonde hair standing in the middle of a group of Indian girls, and the little girl's thinking, where am I? How did I get here? This is a picture of culture shock. Oh, dear Lord, what's next? How do I, how do, I do this? These people think I'm funny. They're laughing at me. They're poking at me. They're pulling on my hair. My son said to me yesterday, he's... Uh, He's, what is he, 10? He's 11? He's 10. Good, my daughter's here to remind me. I've got three kids. By the time my dad gets to a second kid, he forgets. My 10-year-old son says, Dad, when are you going to take me to Africa? And I said, son, if I take you to Africa, you know, he's got a blonde hair, he's all toe head. I said, expect him to be pulling on your hair the whole time. Because as soon as you walk in the room, all the kids will take your hand, they'll pull on it. Because that's what they do. They've never seen blonde hair like that, especially on a kid. So you show up in these places and they're poking at you, they're laughing at you, they're touching you, they're pulling your hair. And you're like, what's going on? This is culture shock. You feel like a child. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I have no idea what's happening in my life. So defining culture shock is a still review from last week. Culture shock is losing the ability to think clearly or rationally. It's just gone. You don't even have one percentage 
of ration, rational thought. It's just gone. It's like culture shock hits, all rationality, all clarity is wiped from your mind, and you're thinking, what am I going to do now? I feel totally lost. What were some of the things that happened in culture shock? We realize that when we go far from home, our culture shock becomes more intense. The further you go from home, the more challenges you'll face. The further you go from home, the more time it will take to adapt. The further you go from home, the more cultural training you need. Never throw away the books that we are studying now. They will make the most sense to you and they will be the strongest in helping you take root into this new culture when we talk about our topic tonight. These books now are just theories, but when you're living there, they're gonna become your lifeline. And then in, in concluding on our, um, on our review, we looked at our cultural adjustment map, and we looked at you can enter in, into this new culture with openness and acceptance, or with fear and anticipation, and you're not flexible, and you're pushing them off, because no matter how you enter in, you're gonna find frustration, confusion, tension, and most of all, embarrassment. No one wants to be embarrassed, especially when you're an adult and you're used to being a leader and you're sent out from your church as a leader. You're going to go plant the gospel. You're going to make a difference. You're going to be, and I'll use the term pioneer because it's an old term, but it makes sense. I'm going to go there and bring the gospel, but I feel like a total failure and I'm actually spending more time being embarrassed than I am as a leader. That's enough to cause you to break. Then you have a group of choices to make. I'm either going to be observant, listen, ask questions, learn, and then enter into their world, or I'm going to criticize, I'm going to rationalize, and I'm going to withdraw. You have those choices every time you enter into a world. And we talked about don't fight it. Just go with it. Don't fight it. Go with it. Love them. Be a part of them. Remain soft. Any questions about our reading or last week's message at all? You guys are all good? Okay, great. You're like so quiet tonight. So we give you time to like talk and interact. We're all good? No hands up? Okay, great. Excellent. All right, tonight, the cycles of culture shock. The cycles of culture shock. Last week we talked about culture shock itself. What is it? And this week what we want to cover is the cycles of it. This means that sometimes it's very faint. Other times it peaks out and then you drop off. And then you start to rise back up again. Another way to put it is the roller coaster ride of culture shock. You guys have all been on a roller coaster? In the beginning, it feels really fun. You're going click, 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 click. You're going up. All the anticipation's there. This is awesome. Like, take your child when you have children on their first roller coaster ride, sit them in the very front seat, and make sure they raise their hands, right? Like, this is great, this is great, this is great. And all of a sudden, you get to that top part. You guys have all been on the roller coaster? And then you drop, and then the streams come, and I can't believe this is crazy. What am I doing, Dad? You hate me. Why would you bring me on this? And you're holding them back. And then after a while, they go through the loop, right? And, they come, and then once they're done, what do they say? That was awesome. Let's do it again. Well, that's what culture is. But spread that, that 30-second emotion out over two years. I love it, I love it, I love it. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Oh, wait, this is great. Let's do it again. Two years of that emotion is enough to make it crazy. It's not just a 30 second ride at Disneyland or wherever you go to. Now know this, in level three, we're gonna discuss this in detail. So if you want to come to level three, it's gonna be a smaller class. It's gonna be what we call round table, where we'll have two teachers, will be question and answer, and you can interact as much as you want. So come to level three, we'll discuss this in a way deeper um, way. That's an invitation for all of you. We would love to have you in our level three. So, the cycles of culture shock. There are going to be six of them. Each person is gonna go through these in a unique way. Some people will skip a few of these depending upon where they go, but everybody goes through these six different cycles of culture shock. The first one being the preparation stage. The preparation stage could be between three months and for others, three years. The reason why there's a difference is the younger you are, the shorter that time is because you're not established. You don't have houses and you know, families and jobs and, and you know parents to take care of. You're younger, everything's okay, and you just say, I'm called, your pastor says, let's do it. You get a little bit of training and a lot of prayer, and you go. So it might take three months. 
the older you are, the longer it takes, right? To disconnect and disconnect and make sure this is okay. And oh, I got grandkids, I can't leave my grandkids. There's a whole nother level of trials. So the older you are, the longer it takes, but know this, God's calling you at that specific time for that reason. So number one, preparation. And then number two is when you get there, this is the beginning, uh, let's say first few months, this uh, next part is between one and two months, it's called the honeymoon. Now those of you that are married know what I'm talking about. The honeymoon is, I've been waiting forever to marry this person, and now we're married, everything's perfect. Everything's perfect, I'll never do anything wrong, they'll never do anything wrong, we'll never have any problems in our life, we have plenty of money, everything's perfect. Even if we live in a shoebox, we don't care, because this is a honeymoon stage. Well, that doesn't last forever. One to two months, depending upon how far you go from home and what it's like. Once the honeymoon stage is over, this is the, the climax of that roller coaster, then you drop into what we call disillusionment. Disillusionment is, I had no idea that it was going to feel like this. I had no idea it was going to be like this. One of the main reasons for a culture's class is so that when you hit disillusionment, you don't check out and walk away from God's call. You're able to get through it and to push on. So two or three months of that constant downward spiral, feeling like there's no end and you're never going to make it. Number three, coping. You've hit the ground, you're down the bottom, you're depressed as can be, you're not going to leave and walk away from God's call, you're just going to hold on for dear life. That's coping. Coping is, I don't like it, I don't want it, it's not what I expected, but I'm not giving up. This is the word tenacity. I'm not giving up. I'm just going to hold on. I'm going to hold on. I feel like I'm going to fall into an empty abyss and I'm going to disappear forever, but I'm not going to let go of this rope or this pipe or something I'm holding on to. I'm just going to cope. How long is coping? Six months to a year. This is the stripping. This is the total breaking. This is when God creates in you the ability to truly represent him. He's emptying you of yourself, and he's beginning to live in you, and it has to happen when you're broken. So that's the coping stage, and we're going to develop all these as we go on. After coping, what do we have? Adjusting. The adjustment phase is, I've been to the top, I've been to the bottom, and I've been skidding across the bottom for six months now, and all of a sudden there's this little change going on. I'm actually starting to feel normal again. There is a chance I'm going to like it. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. If you guys ever run through like a black tunnel, when I was a kid, we would go down into the drainage pipes, and you could see at the very end this little pinprick of light, and we would run as fast as we could. And of course, if we hit our faces, we didn't care. We were like eight or 10 years old. We'd run as fast as we could, and that light would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, like you know, a couple minutes in, we're standing out in this huge amount of sun because we came out. But what did it start with? One little speck. And we just kept going towards it, and that speck got bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, we were fine. We were out of the dark. We were, you know, out of the, the, um, the, the desperation, all of that. So that's what adjustment is. Adjustment is the beginning of seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. Then you have another 6 to 12 months of this time of adjusting, becoming like the people, starting to like your new culture. And then number six, settlement. Settlement or settling means, wow, this feels more like home than where I was born. That's a really strange feeling. And I come back to visit my family here in America, California, where I'm from, and I feel a little awkward in California. How did that happen? Because when I left here, this is where I found all my comfort, and now I don't even feel comfortable back in my mother's home. I remember coming home for Christmas and eating dinner with my mom, thinking, where am I? What is this food? Why is everybody talking like that? Why aren't we using silverware? What's wrong with this picture? What had happened is I became more African than American. That's called settling. Now I actually like living here. I actually like living here. So those are the six cycles. We're going to spend the rest of the class developing these cycles. Before we do, let's be very clear. You will go through emotional extremes. On all of these ventures, some of them will be high, some of them will be low, you're going to go through emotional extremes. These are extremes that most of us have never experienced until we're in a cross-cultural situation. Now remember our rule, knowing is half the battle, 
When we know we're going to go through these things, they won't affect us as strong, meaning they won't kick us off course or confuse us or cause us to feel like we're out of control. We'll know that these things are normal. You will go from, I love it here, to the next morning, I hate it here. To a week from now, I love it here. And then two weeks from now, I hate it here. And you'll be up and down and you'll think, am I crazy? That's the one thing you're going to ask yourself on the mission field when God calls you out. This is not a short trip trip. This is long term. You're going to wake up in the morning you're going to say, am I insane? When you feel that, remember this class and say, no, I'm not insane. Every cross-cultural worker goes through it. I love it. I hate it. I love it. I hate it. And after about two years of doing that, it will actually become, hey, it's not that bad. You know what? It's going to be okay. And you won't love it or hate it. It will just be normal. But you've got a lot of time between those emotional extremes. And then the other emotional extreme is nothing can stop me versus I will never make it. Nothing can stop me. I am like a freight train. You guys understand a freight train weighs tens of thousands of pounds. And once you get that train moving, nothing stops that train. And then the next minute, you're like, there's no way I'm going to make it. There's no way I'm going to make it. I can't even get out of bed. I can't even walk. So in one sense, God's with me. And my church is behind me. And God's spoken. And this is going to be awesome. Or, you know what? I'm not even going to get out of bed today. I'm never going to get out of the plane and go back to America because I'm too big of a failure. And the people don't like me here. And you know what? I hate it here. Why don't I just disappear? Why don't I just disappear? Nothing can stop me. And then the next moment, I will never make it. You will feel Follow me on this term? Schizophrenic. Okay? You know the medical term? The psychological term? Schizophrenic. What's it mean? You're up, you're down. You're around here, you're over there. You're changing constantly. That is what culture shock will do to you. Total schizophrenia. Now, it's not permanent. It's not permanent. Okay? These are just cycles that we're going to go through. The more intense you are as a person, the more type A you are, the harder this is going to be. You see, so there I am, like all type A and excited and wanting to conquer the world, and I'm going through all this stuff, and my wife, she's just mellow. Now, she's got a vision and a focus. She's got things she's going to do, but she's doing this like these little bumps. And I'm like, way up and way down, way up and way down. Everybody will go through it differently. The more type A you are, the more passionate you are, the, hot, the higher you rise and the further you'll fall. Just the way it is. And as a team, know this about each other and love each other through it. And this is our other extreme. Then there's three of the big ones. There's others, but these are the big three. God is speaking truth. One second later, all I can hear is the devil's lies. So on Monday, man, I opened the word, and God just spoke, and it was awesome. And we were having a great time, and we're never going to leave this place, and God's got a purpose for this place. Tuesday morning, you wake up, and all you hear is the devil. That's it. And what does the devil say? You'll never make it. Why are you even here? You're disobeying God's will. The Bible doesn't call you to do this. That's for somebody else. But for you, you need to be back at home working that secular job and not even stepping out in ministry. And so you go from these two extremes. This is the spiritual extremes. Not just the emotions in your heart, but the spiritual warfare that goes on in your mind will shock you. It's a whole other level when you go overseas. Why? Because you're working in the devil's backyard. Like when I was living in Sri Lanka, and I told you, Every uh, intersection, there was a Buddhist, not temple, but a Buddhist statue. On some of them, there, there was these huge Hindu temples with hundreds of gods. Everywhere I went in the country, I felt waves of spiritual hatred. Nobody was mad at me. They were all really pleasant, very kind, and wonderful, hospitable people. But I felt these waves of warfare. And the one band, Shane and Shane, for some reason, they wrote verses in such a way that when I would put that on in my car, I could make it from my house to the Bible college, spiritually. But without Shane and Shane or somebody speaking truth into my mind, I would almost be crazy by the time I got to the Bible college because there was a spiritual warfare going on. God would speak to me all night long about how awesome this book was going to be and teaching Genesis to these pioneer missionaries and all of these things that were going to happen. But by the time I got from my car to the Bible college, as I drove those three hours of like, it was like 20 miles, it took three hours to drive in the traffic, the enemy would just rack my mind with confusion. And I went through this, God speaking, the devil's lying. God speaking, the devil's lying. We're going to talk about this in level three in detail. So make sure you come back for that one. Now, everybody experiences these emotions. On the way home last week, my daughter asked me, 
Dad, is it is it true that if I moved from California to Arizona, I'd go through a little bit of culture adjustment? Yes, absolutely. If I moved to another state, like let's say, you know, Wisconsin, it would be even more because it's further from my home. If you go overseas to do business, let's say you go work in Asia or some other developed country, you're gonna go through these same cultural things. But it gets worse when you go over as a spiritual leader. Because when you enter a new culture, not as a business person, but as a spiritual leader, that's when really everything begins to crumble in your heart because the warfare comes in with the mental instability and all of the feelings of being inferior and everything starts to implode and it feels like there's a black cloud on you. So everybody goes through it in a small way, moving around in your own country, in a medium way, moving around the world for secular work, in a major way, going into foreign countries for a spiritual work. Because the enemy knows you're in his backyard and he's going to come at you with everything he has. So rule number one, God will never change. God will never change. We know that. From the beginning of time until the end of time, let's just say for what we know, Genesis 1-1, Revelations 22, verse 21, God has always been the same. This is the one thing that holds me solid in the sense of my mind is being uh, just bombarded, my, my heart slipping away, my emotions are a wreck, but God's promises in his word will never change. These are the only things that will keep you sane in the midst of these spiritual moments. God remains the same. The only thing that changes, never forget this, the only thing that changes is my emotions. Never. It's never God. It's never the call. It's never the people that God is calling us to minister to. The only thing that changes is my emotions. When that becomes a reality to you, you're able to navigate. You're able to work through all of these cultural changes. When you realize it's not the Lord, it's just me. When it's me and I realize my weakness, then I can move forward. This is what will hold us together. Now, this is a great time because we're about to change subjects. Let's take a five-minute break, and let's come back, and then we'll start the first cycle of culture shock. Okay, let's take a break.